We are done with unit one, and I'm going to start unit two. And unit two has uh, three, these three main topics, the math class, the wrapper classes, and the string class. And today, I'm going to introduce you to this class called the math class, which has a bunch of utilities that help you do math-related functions. So before I show you the math class, I need to explain another important principle here. And this principle is the idea of static. Now, static is a really difficult concept. One of the reasons that most colleges, if you were to walk in today and tell them you want to be a computer scientist and you have no previous background, they shy away from teaching Java as the first language. Which language do most colleges use as the introductory language? Anybody know? Python, that's right. So uh, one of the reasons that they don't like to use Java as the introductory language is because of the things like static, which are kind of hard to understand. I'm going to teach you static slowly over the course of uh, several lessons, but today I'm just going to briefly introduce the topic. So to understand what static means, let's talk a little bit about the classes and the variables that you've already kind of come into contact with. So previously, we developed this class called dog. And we said that if we wanted to create a dog, we would go like this, dog d equals new dog, like this. And then later on in the code, if I wanted to ask the dog its name, I would go d dot get name. Let's look at this structure here for a second, and I've referred to this before in my class. It's noun dot verb, noun dot verb. The period is ownership. It basically connects the verb and the noun together, so it's clear whose name you're asking for. In this case, it's the dog variable D. Now here, you can see that I've constructed this D uh, variable using this dog as a blueprint. This is a class. That is an object. See the difference? This is like a cookie, cookie recipe. That's like a cookie. So what we're going to talk about now is a slightly different concept, where instead of writing it like this, we're going to have an entire class here, in this case, the math class. And then we're going to have some method here like this, min or something like that. So you notice now that what is the noun in my computer science sentence is no longer an object. What is math? What is it? Ms. Ria, what is it? It's a class. How did she know it was a class, Mr. Mason? OK, but this is before the period also, and D is not a class. It's capitalized. So math is a class. Now, math happens to be an important class that's built into the Java libraries. And so we're going to be using this class all year long. And what I want you to understand here is that notice that I'm able to use this method on the math class without ever using a sentence like this. So in other words, I never had to do math m equals new math and then go like m dot min or anything like that. I didn't have to do any of that. I can just go math dot min and then use the method. So math is a class, and min is a static that belongs to the math class. So here, I'm asking the dog D, what is its name, get name, like this, right? I'm asking the dog, what is your name? Here, I'm asking the entire class to provide this min function for me. See the difference between the two? All right. So now we're going to open up our BlueJay and try some of these out and show you how the math class works. I'm going to create a brand new project in BlueJay. We'll call it the math project. And here I'm going to create just a class, a, a, a demo class, just to demonstrate some math capabilities. So there is my demo class. And inside here, I'm going to ask you to put your name, and today's date. And we're going to start off by talking about some math functions today, math methods. And the first one we're going to discuss is the minimum method. So let's say I have some variables here. I go int uh, a equals uh, 7 and int b equals 5. 
and in uh, answer equals zero like that. And now let's say I go something like this. I go answer equals math dot min a and b like that. Can someone raise their hand and tell me what is answer going to have in it after I'm all finished here? Um, let's see. Um, Mr. Garofalo, sir, what's going to be an answer after I execute these commands? Okay, because the minimum between 7 and 5 is 5. So let's run that, try it out. And you can see, indeed, there's a 5 there. Now let's make this just slightly more complicated. Let's say that there was a third variable. like this, and I wanted to calculate the minimum of the three values. You might be tempted to do something like this, but math.min only takes two arguments. You can't do this. You can see that it says there's no such method that takes three arguments. So this is not going to work. So what I want to know is, how can I use the math.min method to figure out the lowest between these three? And there's several ways to do it. I would like you to discuss with the person next to you one possible way to solve this problem. And then I'd like you to implement it on your computer and run it and see if it works. Like that. Like that, sir? Yeah. You don't even need these other parentheses, by the way. That's perfectly okay to have them, but you don't even need them. Yeah, okay, like that? Yeah. Okay, that's also a good solution. Uh, and there's a third solution, which probably is not as obvious, which I'm going to go over with you now. Okay, so what I've done is I've created a temporary variable to get the minimum between these two, and then I compare that one with the other one. So you can see that these are the various ways of using the min function to get a minimum of certain numbers. Now, what I'd like you to do before we move on is try to figure out what would be the Quickest way of doing it with four numbers. Okay, you get the idea? All right, let me show you some things about math.min. Let's say that instead of having uh, integers here, we had decimal numbers. And you can see that it works well with decimal numbers also. Let me show you what the results look like here. And you can see it works. So the thing to know, understand about math.min is that there are variations of min. These are actually different methods being called. They look the same to you because they have the same name. But if you call it with decimal numbers, it, it, you call the decimal version, which returns a decimal. And if you call if you call it with two integers as arguments, then it return you, you're calling the integer version, and it returns an integer result. Try to understand there are two different methods called min in the math class, one that works with integers and the other one that works with decimal numbers. Make sense? Which one do you think you'll call if you mix an integer and one integer and one decimal? The decimal version. Makes sense, right? Okay, so that is math.min. <clears throat> what do you think this one will do? Uh, let's he see here. Uh, Mr. Sneed, sir, what do you think max will do? Okay, so let's try that. You can see it selects the bigger one. Uh, speaking of um, decimal numbers, another thing I realized I forgot to tell you in unit one is, I'll just sneak this in now. Can I do that? What do you think? If I hit the compile button, is it gonna compile or not? All the examples I gave you were with integers, I think. Do you think it'll work with decimal numbers? The answer is yes. Let me show you that. I should have mentioned this when we were discussing uh, increment, pre-increment and post-increment and decrement. This works with uh, decimal numbers also. Okay, now back to today's lesson. So we've gone over, we've covered the min, right? A, B like this. And we've also talked about the max A, B like that. Now, the next one I'd like to talk about is called 
ABS. Can anyone guess what ABS does here? Mr. Pandali, absolute value. Who can raise their hand and tell me the mathematical definition of absolute value? What is the mathematical definition of absolute value? Miss Sophie, distance from zero. Very good, miss. So now how far is 1.7 from zero? Um, let's see here. Miss Tamara, if I take the absolute value of X, what's going to print? Okay, so let's run this. And if I had a negative 1.7, What's going to print this time, Miss Emily? All right. And you can see it's still 1.7, so it's giving you the distance from zero. So that is the, the min, the max, and the absolute value. There's one more I'm going to show you. This one is way more important than the other math functions we're going to learn this year. This one is called random. And random gives you a number in the range zero to one. Now you notice that Mr. Sarkar used a hard bracket here on the zero side and a soft bracket on the one side. What does that mean, Mr. Mason? Okay, it can equal zero, but it can't be one. So let me show you that now. So I've called the math.random function. These are all static methods because you can see I don't have to create a math object. And then I'm asking it to do the random, return a random number, and I'm putting that random number in X, and I'm printing the X. So let's run this. And you can see it gave me that one. If I run it again, is it going to give me the same number, Mr. Sawyer? No because that's the whole point. It gives me a different random number each time. You can see that. Now, if I ran this enough times, I probably would get eventually get a real zero. It's hard to do, but I would never get anything bigger than what? What's the biggest number I could get here, Mr. Garofalo? Yeah, it's all zero with 0.999 like that. All right, so now I have to Go over some stuff that you were supposed to have learned in math class, and hopefully you have learned it. So let's go look over here now. If I go like this, I go y equals x plus 3. If y is a function of x, which it is, what kind of shifting did I do to the x variable to get this function? How did I shift it? Do you remember talking about shifts in your math class? Mr. Sawyer. Uh, so uh, let me let me rephrase my question. Sir, if we're only discussing, I shouldn't have used Y, I realize now. Uh, let's go with Z. Uh, that's not a good choice either. Let's go with uh, uh, M. Okay, I'm only interested in discussing left to right shifts, so left or right. So in that context, sir, so the answer you gave me was the right one. I just phrased the question wrong. Sir, in this context, am I sh is, is the X variable being shifted to the right or to the left to calculate M? It's being shifted to the right by three. How about this one? <laughs> about that one. Mr. Marjoram, what's happening here, sir? Left five. Okay, a little bit harder now. No? Okay, who can raise their hand and tell me what does, yes, Miss Tamara? It's a stretch by a factor of seven. Okay? Now, 
I'm going to tell you something, and I'm only going to mention it subtly. It's really, really important in computer science. Actually, it's important in math also, but it's especially important in computer science. When you see a variable like x, your tendency is to think of it as some, some unknown number. You think of it like that, right? Like there's a number in there. I don't know what it is. But it's actually much better both in math and into computer science. Instead of thinking of it like that, try to think of it as a range of numbers. Try to think of it as a range of numbers. In this case, that range of numbers, because I've set it here like this, starts off as a number between 0 and up to but not including 1. So what I'm doing here is I'm not so much just shifting the number to the right. I'm actually shifting the entire range to the right. Likewise, over here, I'm shifting the range to the left. And here, I'm stretching the range. So what I want you to do now is I want you to get rid of these comments and replace them. We'll start with this one here. Uh, we'll go um, new range. And I want you to tell me what is the new range on the variable. And over here, I'll reset the variable. And tell me, what is the new range over here? And here, I'll reset the variable again. And tell me, what is the new range over here? Okay, so what I want to know is, when I do this shifting, here, look, this used to be the range, right? That's what That was the range here. So let me write that down. It was the range, 0 one like that what's the range going to be after each of these operations that's what i want to know you work with your partner and fill these in right over here in these three places okay let's get back together now uh let's do this first one miss chacon look over here i had this range and then i shifted it by three what's the new range on m miss three four is right but now i need to know what kind of brackets to use very good, miss. Hard bracket here and a soft bracket here. This is another one where I shifted the whole thing to the left. And what I want to know is what's my new range going to be? And I'm going to ask for help from Mr. Miss Davis. Can you tell me what is the new range on M here, miss? Notice that the length of the range remains one in all cases. You see that, right? Because I haven't, I haven't stretched it. I've only moved the range. Now this one here, once again here, the range has been reset to zero to one. What's this range going to be, uh, Mr. Pandali? What's the range here, sir? Very good, sir. Zero seven here, like that. See what's going on, right? Okay. So now. I have a bit of a challenge for you. What I want to do is I want to use this math.random uh, function. We call it a method in Java. Most other uh, languages call it a function. We're going to use it to simulate the role of a dice. In fact, one dice, which is called a die. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to say int die equals. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do um, uh, math.random. And then we're going to multiply it by something. And then we're going to shift it by something. And then we're going to take the result. And we want an integer when we're all finished, right? So we're going to cast it to an integer like that. And then when I, when I print the die value, I want only numbers 1 through 6 inclusive. So try to figure out what these question marks should be. That's the goal. Try to figure out what should the question marks be. How much should I stretch it? Which Do I need to do any shifting to it? Which direction should I shift it, et cetera? So please try and work with your partner to figure out how to use the math.random method to simulate the roll of a die. A dice has six sides. You can get numbers one through six on it. Please work on that now. Okay, Mr. Degouge, sir, what? how much do I need to stretch this by? Okay. And how much do I need to shift it, if any, sir? Okay, very good. Now, 
let me ask you this. If I run this, right, and it gives me a number, let's say it gives me four, can I be 100% certain this is working? No. You can see that I need to do repeated experiments here to make sure that the numbers stay in bounds, right? So I'm going to show you something now. This is later in our course, but we need a, something called a loop in order to run this line multiple times. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a loop to these lines of code. And um, it will it will show up in multiple times. So I'm going to go 4 int i, i equals 0, i is less than 50. I'll run this 50 times, plus plus i. We'll talk about this uh, later on in the course. But for now, just go with it. I'm going to run this experiment 50 times and print 50 results and see if I get legitimate dice rolls each time. If I run it 50 times and it works all 50, there's a good chance I've got the right formula. Let's run it now and see what happens. <laughs> and you can see that I'm getting the right rolls. Now, if I was worried that my formula was skewed, how would I figure that out? What would I do to figure out if like, some numbers were coming up too often or not often enough? If I wanted to study that, how would I do it? Who can tell me? <laughs> Yes, sir. No, like let's say I'm not getting enough sixes. How would I know? What would you do? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you, you should count, like you could count how many of each one you get and then run the experiment thousands of times to see if you're getting a reasonable distribution. Now, each time you run it, will you get the exact same number of ones, twos, threes, fours, five, and sixes? No, but you should get roughly the same. You agree? Okay, so now uh, we're going to finish today's class with this one idea, which is that here I have used the numbers 6 and 1 to, to massage the math.random function to give me the range that I want. You see that, right? So what I want to do now is I want to come up with a general formula. If I need to generate a range that's in this range right here, A comma B, Right? I want the lowest number to be A, the highest number to be B, and I want to be inclusive of both of those. What would be like the ge generic formula? So let's say I go uh, N equals in something in that range. I would go int N equals, and then I would have to have some formula here. And then I would have to put some, some, some stretching, some... Um, uh, some uh, shifting and and, uh, and that kind of thing, and I'll I'll put up a generic formula here, and there's the generic formula. And what I want to know is what should uh, these things be? Instead of a and b, though, I'm going to call these min and max. And these are variables now. These are not methods anymore. Okay, these are not methods I'm talking about. I'm just creating variables called min and max. And uh, what I want to know now is what, sh what should I do with these min and max things in here in order to get this to be massaged into this range? That's what, that's what you need to figure out in the time that remains. All right, so I, I want to create a general formula using math.random that gives me numbers in this range. So for the die example, this min would be one and max would be six. But I want to know what would be a more generic example here. So please work with your partner to try and figure out what would this, this formula be. And at the end of class, or maybe at the beginning of class tomorrow, I'll go over the right answer with you. Please go ahead and do that now. When does this class end? 33. Oh, 33. Okay, I have more time than I thought. We'll, we'll have time to finish this today. Okay, it's not easy. I'm just going to give you the answer right now because I've tortured you enough today. It's max. Minus min plus one plus min. Now, let me give you some advice. Let me give you some advice. This formula is going to come up all year long. It's going to come up for like, like all of a sudden you're working on some chapter you think has nothing to do with random. And all of a sudden there's a test question or a quiz question that has math.random in it. Now, you have two choices. You can memorize this formula. That's the bad choice. That's the bad choice. Or you can go home tonight 
or maybe after the test is over and figure out why this formula is like this. And if you do that, the next time you need it, whether it's two weeks from now or seven years from now, because seven years from now, you won't remember the formula. But if you, if you understand why it's like this, then you will be able to derive it at a moment's notice when you need it on some future college test or, or work life environment or whatever. Okay, try to understand why it's like this. Now, imagine I was doing the dice thing. What would max and min be? One and six. So you can see there'd be six here minus one. Well, how much would that be? Five plus one is six. So you would stretch it by six and then you would add one. See how it works? So you, one way or the other, you need to know this formula. It's better to understand where it comes from and why it's like this so you can derive it when you need it. But another alternative, not as good, but will get you through this year is if you just memorize the formula. So that is my little discussion for you about the math class. The next time we're together will be Friday. And that is the last time I see you before the unit one exam. So. If you have any questions about Unit 1, please bring them on Friday for our little review session. If you if you don't have any questions, then I'll just keep teaching Unit 2 then. We'll talk about wrapper classes. But I want to leave you some time on Friday uh, to review or go over anything you may not understand. Maybe you got a question wrong on today's quiz that you want me to go over or something like that. That'll be Friday. And then after that, the next time I see you is on the test day. Test, 15 questions. What did I say, uh, 40 minutes? 35 minutes, 35 minutes, 15 questions. Anybody have any questions for now?